Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're diving back into Mr. Butt, well, Kyle Butt, it, phrasing, whatever. This time it's for some education about the superhuman qualities of the Bible. You know what would be a superhuman quality that would make it appear more likely to be a book written by God rather than a compilation of books written by men? If it didn't need to be written, translated, and distributed by men. But alas, no Bible has ever appeared out of nothing. No isolated tribe of people have ever been found to already possess Bibles. No Bibles found on the surface when rovers land on Mars. Nope, they're only ever the result of scribes and printing presses. But hey, it's just missing that one ability. Let's see if it has any other neat abilities. The Bible. What do you think about it? I think it is a book of cultural and historical significance, but that it should not be used as a guide by which to live your life. It displays an outdated moral framework that, if fully implemented, would amount to a great increase in human harm, not to mention animal cruelty. Is it God's word? Most definitely not. If you think it's God's word, why do you think it's God's word? If you think it's not, why don't you think it's God's word? Well, the aforementioned heinous moral code that pretty much all modern Christians agree is immoral, for starters. You wouldn't need apologists trying to figure out how the slavery in the Bible was actually moral, or how the treatment of women was moral, or how the genocides that were committed and commanded by God are moral if the Bible were actually moral. Christians want us to believe that God is the ultimate source of our morality, while simultaneously trying to distract from the fact that God behaves in a way that our morality says is morally wrong. And when we suggest that God is immoral, we get indignant responses from apologists demanding to know how we have the audacity to question God's morality. Well, if God gave us our moral senses, then God gave us the moral sense to know that he is immoral. And then this gets excused with an appeal to the fall. God gave us the perfect moral sense, but then the fall distorted it so that now our moral senses are imperfect. But then these same apologists will turn around and appeal to our universal moral senses as one of the lines of evidence for God. You really have to twist your brain to several nested hierarchical pretzels in order to follow these lines of thinking. You know, there are lots of reasons that people give for thinking that the Bible is God's Word or isn't God's Word, but how would we go about coming to a conclusion on that? I mean, God is supposed to be all-powerful, is he not? Would the easiest method not be for him to just show up and confirm it? Well, here's what we would need to do. We would need to provide characteristics or traits that the Bible has that show that it is of superhuman origin. So, for instance, my earlier mentioned trait of not needing a human from which to originate. It's really hard to argue that it is of superhuman origin when it has literally never been observed to originate anywhere but from a human. Now, what we simply mean by that is we'd have to show that the Bible contains things that people on their own simply could not have come up with. So, like if the pages of the book were found to be made of a stable isotope of fluorovium, for instance? Fluorovium doesn't have any stable isotopes, so that would be quite impressive. It would require every single copy to break possibly several laws of physics in order to continue existing. That would be pretty superhuman. Does the Bible exhibit traits, contain characteristics that are of divine origin that people just simply couldn't have come up with? No. No, it does not. The best that can be done are vague prophecies that could look fulfilled if you don't think about them too much, and scientific facts that were either already well established when the Bible was being written, or are not actually scientific facts but the projection of current scientific knowledge into passages that weren't actually talking about that. Yes, as a matter of fact it does. In fact, I'm going to give you a list of seven things that the Bible contains, characteristics or qualities, that are simply superhuman. Well, they better be bloody impressive. First, I'd like to suggest to you that the Bible is completely scientifically accurate. Oh, okay. Good to know. I guess pi is equal to three, and ants are independent creatures just out for themselves, not part of complicated colonies. You know, the Bible was written, at least started being written, in about 1450 BC. So it's understandable that they wouldn't have had a perfect knowledge of the inner workings of ant colonies. 
But no, you want the book to be perfect, so I guess we have to ignore all the science about how ants works. Also, scholarly consensus usually dates the oldest parts of the Bible as having been written around 745 BCE, so not quite 3,500 years ago, more like almost 2,800 years ago. But, I mean, Kyle believes that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, so he's no stranger to ignoring scholarly consensus. That is almost 3,500 years ago or so, and yet there's not a single scientific inaccuracy in all of the Bible. Ecclesiastes says the sun rises, then goes down, then hastens to the place where it rises again, displaying the typical cosmology of the time with a flat earth and the sun traveling underneath it during the night to get back to the rising place in the east. Leviticus classifies bats as a type of bird. Now, sure, technically the Hebrew word being translated as bird there would mean things that fly rather than what we specifically call birds today, and they didn't have the classification system that we use today, so they had no reason to make that distinction. No reason, that is, unless the author of the book had access to advanced scientific knowledge that would allow him to record it in a way that would not appear to be scientifically inaccurate later on. Or, you know, maybe one of the superhuman powers that the Bible could have would be the inability to translate something wrong. No translator would ever have thought to use the English word bird there because that would be wrong according to the meaning of the original text, so it wouldn't be possible. The existence of apologists who make careers out of trying to fix verses like this are an indication that the verses like this are broken in the first place. It wouldn't need fixing if it were actually the word of God and had superhuman qualities. A lot of people are going to say that there are. They're going to claim that the Bible contains scientific inaccuracies. No, it's not a claim. It just does contain scientific inaccuracies. Mustard seeds are not the smallest of seeds, nor does the mustard plant grow into the largest of all garden plants. Stars cannot fall from heaven. Insects do not have four legs. I could go on. There are many scientific inaccuracies in the Bible. Now, sure, most of these do have apologetic responses, but I find them to be rather lacking. For instance, AIG's explanation for Jesus' statement about the mustard seeds is to appeal to evolution, believe it or not. No smaller seeds had evolved prior to Jesus' parable about the mustard seed. Not only is this blatantly false, the Jews of Jesus' day would have been familiar at least with black orchids, which also have seeds smaller than mustard, but it also assumes that Jesus would have been happy to provide a parable that he knew would be scientifically inaccurate after some time had passed. Was Jesus unable to think of a better metaphor? Is this an admission that the Bible is not universally relevant regardless of how times change? Either this is a scientific error, or God has some shortcomings. Which would you prefer? But it just doesn't. And what's more, not only does it not have inaccuracies, but the Bible contains scientific facts that we didn't learn how important they were and how profound they were until hundreds or sometimes thousands of years later. I find this argument to actually be kind of self-defeating. If the Bible actually contained this profound scientific knowledge, then the profound scientific knowledge would have been discovered by the Hebrews while they were writing the Bible, and so we would say that yes, cultures did have that scientific knowledge at the time the Bible was written, and so this knowledge would then cease to be profound. The Hebrews would just be the culture that discovered that particular thing. But your argument relies entirely on all this scientific knowledge being so obscure as to be useless until we figure it out for ourselves, which means that it wasn't actually scientific knowledge, it was just statements that can be made to look like they might kinda align with our current scientific understanding of the world if you interpret them the right way. If the Bible were actually being actively used to make new scientific discoveries, that might be a start. But it's not. And let's not forget that the Bible is not alone in being an ancient text that has said things that have later been interpreted as having been scientifically accurate if you squint at it just right. The Rig Veda, for instance, says the sun has tied the earth and other planets through attraction and moves them around itself as if a trainer moves newly trained horses around itself holding the reins. That sounds an awful lot like a superficially accurate description of gravity and orbital mechanics, and it was written around 1500 BCE, so it even predates your ridiculously early date for the earliest books of the Bible. Does this mean that the Rig Veda is divinely inspired, or does it mean that sometimes meaning can be read into ancient texts that just wasn't there to begin with? For instance, the Bible mentioned in the first five books that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Yes, and the book of Leviticus was estimated to have been written between 538 and 332 BCE. Do you know what overlaps with that? 
Aristotle's writings on blood. All animals are endowed with a fluid whose lack, either natural or symptomatic, causes their death. In some animals, this liquid is their blood, while in others, it is a colorless liquid which replaces blood. The ancient Greeks considered blood to be a necessary nutrient for living bodies. Now, you have two options here. Either blood being important to life is not a profound scientific discovery that humans of the time were incapable of making without supernatural intervention, or else the ancient Greeks had supernatural intervention to give them this discovery as well. Which do you prefer? No, we didn't figure that out until the mid-1800s. We were literally bleeding people to death thinking that we were helping them. You seem to be misunderstanding the thinking behind bloodletting. It's not that people didn't realize that blood was important, it was that they thought that sickness was caused by an imbalance of the humors, with the four humors being blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. Throughout history, there were several methods of balancing the humors. Bloodletting was one, but there was also purging, catharsis, and diuresis, to name a few others. Mainly, they would heal you by either making you bleed, crap, piss, or vomit. It wasn't until the first century CE, when Galen of Pergamum declared blood to be the most dominant humor, that bloodletting became the regular treatment for most illnesses. But again, it is important to note, this isn't because they didn't know that blood was important to staying alive, it was because they didn't understand what caused disease, and so they were trying to balance the various bodily fluids, of which they understood that blood was directly tied to life, but also believed that it had to be balanced with the other ones. Also worth mentioning is that bloodletting is a legitimate treatment still today. It is just used in very specific circumstances, such as for patients with hemochromatosis, where they tend to get an accumulation of iron in the liver, and periodic bloodletting can stop it from getting to dangerous levels. And of course, I managed to say all of this without even bringing up the fact that the ancient Hebrews practiced bloodletting as well. There are many Talmudic writings which suggest that they thought periodic bloodletting was a hygienic process that was done for preventative reasons. So not only did the same culture that wrote the life of the flesh is in the blood also practice bloodletting, but they didn't even wait for a person to be sick before starting it. The life of the flesh is in the blood. The Bible had said that hundreds or thousands of years before we ever found out that that was true. So why then did these medieval Christian doctors living in highly Christian times with access to these very writings of which you speak take so long to figure it out? If it is so obvious just from that statement that bloodletting is bad, then why did the same culture who made that statement also practice bloodletting? That's not a subtle statement, it's fairly obvious. But actually, I'd like to take it a bit deeper than that. The life of the flesh is not in the blood. The blood just carries nutrients to the cells and waste away from the cells. The cells are what make up the flesh. Sure, they need blood to bring them nutrients to continue living for extended periods, but the cells that make up your tissue can survive for sometimes up to 12 hours after circulation stops. And they don't die because of some magic life-containing property of blood. It's that they are cut off from fresh nutrients and waste management. Individual cells can be kept alive without any blood at all, as long as they have a solution with which to engage in this nutrient exchange. The second aspect of the Bible that proves that it's God's Word is that the Bible is perfectly historically accurate. Okay. So if it is perfectly historically accurate, then that means that Jesus was a real person, which I'm willing to grant that, but he was born during an empire-wide Roman census during Augustus' reign that forced people to travel to the cities that their ancient ancestors were from in order to register. And this all happened while Quirinius was governor of Syria. There was a census in 6 CE while Quirinius was governor, but it was only a census of Judea, so it wouldn't have affected Joseph who lived in Galilee. But if this census is the one that was talked about in the Bible, then Herod cannot have been the king as he died in 4 BCE. So we have a census that is clearly exaggerated as there are no records of such a large scale endeavor found anywhere outside of the book of Luke, which had requirements that would have been impossible to fulfill or verify and would have caused mass disruption of empire wide commerce as people stop doing what it is they normally do in order to go and travel to their ancestors homes and which is said to have taken place during the tenure of a governor who didn't become governor until a decade after the king that was supposed to be king during all of this had died. But yeah, it's perfectly historically accurate. You know, many people have accused the Bible of making historical 
mistakes, of having historical inaccuracies, of saying things about people or places that we find out later were not true. Yep. And that's because it does all of that, all of it, in many places. But you know that's not the case. Well, let's hypothetically grant historical accuracy to the Bible. Now, I know this would be a huge concession, as it is not even close to being true. But what does this say about it being of supernatural origins? Nothing. All that says is that people who lived in a time and place got some details about the time and place in which they lived right. But the Bible doesn't even manage to lumber over that low bar. The Bible doesn't even consider the Bible to be historically accurate. Matthew often went out of his way to correct details in Mark, such as the prophecy in Mark chapter 1 verse 2, which Mark says is from the book of Isaiah, and then goes on to quote a mixture of verses from both Malachi and Isaiah. When Matthew tells that story, he omits the part of the quote that is from Malachi, thereby correcting it. Mark also gets the Ten Commandments wrong, adding in one about not defraud in chapter 10 verse 19, which Matthew removes in his version. So if the Bible doesn't even think that the Bible is historically accurate, why should we? In fact, the Bible is 100% perfectly historically accurate. Sure, buddy. Keep telling yourself that. You have finds like the David stone, the David inscription that prove that David was a king of Israel. At best, this inscription means that the house of David was a real thing as early as the 9th century BCE. It doesn't even get you to the historicity of King David the person. Finds like the Pilate inscription that proved that Pilate was the governor of Judea at the time that the Bible says. I don't think that anyone does dispute the fact that Pilate was the governor at that time. This is just basic information that we would expect to be correct about any work of historical fiction. In the Doctor Who episode, The Impossible Astronaut, they travel back in time to 1969 and talk to President Richard Nixon. I look at American historical records and find that Richard Nixon was indeed president in 1969. Do I now conclude that the Doctor, Riversong, Amy, and Rory are all real people who do real time traveling? Like, no. Getting basic historical facts right is the minimum expectation of a book like the Bible. It is not evidence that the other fantastical events are true. In fact, we can use the extra-biblical references to Pilate to compare what they have to say about Pilate to how the Bible portrays him to see if the Bible story sounds like something he was actually likely to do. The Bible tells the story of a Pilate who is scared of the wrath of the Jewish leaders and is desperately trying to maintain peace and placate the population. Philo of Alexandria and Josephus tell stories of a pilot who does things explicitly to piss off the Jews, including having armed soldiers in a crowd that he is addressing beat random people in the crowd to death, and purposely doing things that would break Jewish laws in order to anger the Jews, to the point where the emperor had to intervene and get him to back down. Eventually, Pilate's ruthless and cruel behavior had him removed from office and recalled to Rome to stand trial, though the emperor died before he got there, and it is unclear whether Caligula, the next emperor, actually followed through with the trial, though it can be inferred from Philo's decidedly unflattering portrayal of him that he did have a trial and it did not go well for him. So, if we ask the Bible, Pilate was a gentle soul who was troubled at the prospect of executing an innocent person for the sake of placating the Jewish leaders, but ultimately he decided that he needed to keep the peace no matter what. But if we ask the other historical sources, he was a dick whose dickishness ultimately got him fired because he refused to back down from pissing off the locals. So the Roman and Jewish sources both agree that he was an ass who loved nothing more than to enrage the locals, while the Christian source shows him as a meek, easily swayed leader who was concerned about innocent lives and keeping the peace. Sorry, but Pilate the Dick has better attestation than Pilate the Gentle. The perfect historical accuracy of the Bible is displayed by its perfectly historically inaccurate portrayal of historical figures. And then you also, number three, have the unity of the Bible. Unity? Is that where the Gospels can't agree on details like who was at the tomb, who found it empty, or whether or not it was guarded and stuff like that? Or even in other places of the story where John purposely rewords parts of the story to fit his different picture of a more godlike Jesus, such as the direct statement that Jesus carried his own cross, in direct contrast with the Synoptic Gospels, which have Simon of Cyrene helping to carry the cross. 
or maybe the multiple deaths of King Saul, the multiple deaths of Goliath, the multiple deaths of Judas, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, the Bible is far from a unified book. You know, the Bible was written over a period of about 1,600 years, about 1450 B.C. to about 100 A.D. It's a catalog of 66 different books. They were written by 40 different men. I've never really understood this argument. Like, sure, if all these writers over such a span of time actually had managed to put together a perfectly unified narrative, that would be slightly impressive. But really, all this serves to do is to point out that God didn't see fit to give his people his important message until they had floundered around without it for a few thousand years first. And even then, he only gave it to us piece by piece over the course of 1600 years. If this book was so important, why would he not give it to us all at once? And why would it need 40 writers? Surely God could have written it himself and done a much better job of it, could he not? And don't young earth creationists typically believe that God is the ultimate author of the Bible anyway? Why involve middlemen at all? It just doesn't make any sense. And those 40 different men had various backgrounds. Some of them were kings. Some of them were shepherds. Some of them were tax collectors. They spoke different languages. Yeah, almost like it was written by people and not by God. Seems to me that an attribute that would point to the Bible being a unified message would be that if it were, you know, unified instead of having such obvious differences like linguistics. And yet, with those 66 books, there's not a single legitimate contradiction between the writings. See, Kyle had to add the qualifier legitimate here because he is well aware of the many, many, many apparent contradictions, many of which actually turn out to be legitimate. But let's just ignore that for a second and pretend that they can all be explained away. Can you call a book perfect if you have to retcon an explanation for apparent contradictions in order to make it not contradictory? Most of the contradictions would be easy enough to just avoid in the first place. John says Jesus carried his own cross. So the typical apologetic to make that work with the other Gospels that say Simon carried it for him is that Jesus carried his own cross at first and then became too weak, so Simon carried it the rest of the way. Okay, so rather than have John literally say that he carried his own cross and make no mention of anyone else ever doing it, Either add in a bit about it being until his strength failed him and Simon of Cyrene helped, or just leave out the bit that explicitly states that he did it himself. Boom. I fixed the contradiction. The Bible would have been less contradictory if it had been written with this minor proposed change, which would not affect any doctrine at all. Well, any modern doctrine. It would have had a pretty big effect on the doctrine that John was pushing that made him explicitly contradict the synoptics like that, but no modern doctrine that I am aware of would be changed by this. So I have now improved the Bible. But if something can be improved, can it really be said to have been perfect before the improvement? And most of the frequent go-to contradictions could be resolved in a similar fashion without the need for mental gymnastics, thereby improving the supposedly perfect book. So the real problem with the contradictions is not that the contradictions themselves don't have any apologetics that might harmonize them, it's that there is the appearance of contradiction in the first place, especially for the ones that would be easy to harmonize with minor non-doctrine affecting changes to the text itself than with trying to explain away the differences after the fact. Not only is there not a legitimate contradiction, but the writings show that a unifying hand was behind the writing of all 66 books. So the message of Ecclesiastes that everything is meaningless, so just live life in the moment and enjoy the things in this life while they last, goes along perfectly with the teaching that many churches follow of not storing up for yourself treasures on earth, instead storing up treasures in heaven? I don't know, man. Let's also not forget that we can actually watch the development of the Hebrew culture through the Bible as they go from being polytheist to henotheist to monotheist. Seems to me like if it were one cohesive message, it should have just started at monotheist. But that's just not what we see. There is simply nothing like that of human design in the world. I would agree with that statement and include the fact that the Bible is of human design. The Bible's not as you're describing it, is what I'm getting at here. Number four, the Bible has accurately predicted the future. Nope. Later books include details that would appear to fulfill prophecies in earlier books. 
At best, this just means that the authors of the later books were aware of the earlier books, which is made abundantly obvious by the fact that they regularly quote them. We all understand that if there were a book that could look into the future hundreds of years, sometimes even thousands of years, and predict with 100% accuracy what was going to happen, then that book would be superhuman. I will grant that for argument's sake. Which then also means that the Bible is not superhuman, because, you know, Tyre still exists. Egypt wasn't conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, though he did invade it. Egypt beat him off, and not in a fun way. All of the fulfilled ones that I am aware of were either authored later than the event the prophecy was supposed to be predicting, or were vague enough to interpret a success onto them no matter what happens. And that's exactly what we see in the Bible. We see Bible writers talking about the fall of a certain city, like the city of Tyre. Yeah, the Bible also says that it will never be rebuilt. But you can go to Tyre today if you like, because it was rebuilt and it still exists. And then hundreds of years later, it happening. Notice on the screen that he's mentioning Alexander the Great conquering Tyre in 332 BCE. One tiny problem here. The prophecy in Ezekiel 26 doesn't actually say that Alexander the Great would conquer Tyre, but it's not vague about who would be doing it. It explicitly says that Nebuchadnezzar will conquer them. You know, that guy who failed to conquer Egypt like the prophecy said he would? He also failed to conquer Tyre like the prophecy said he would. He did lay siege to it for 13 years, he just never made it past the city walls. So. How exactly is the wrong ruler conquering the city hundreds of years after the named ruler was supposed to do it a fulfillment of prophecy? We see Bible writers talking about the predicted Messiah, several hundred prophecies about the Messiah coming and those predictive prophecies coming true in the life of Jesus Christ. Without getting into why so many of those ones just flat out fail, is it really a surprise that people writing the story of Jesus some 30 years after his death were able to write the story in a way that would make it fit with prophecies that they also knew about? But the problem is, they didn't even do that well. They use prophecies that are specific enough to obviously not apply to Jesus, but then they remove the context from them when they quote them, just using one or two verses where it looks like they line up. Quote mining seems to be built into this religion. The predictive prophecy in the Bible is of superhuman design. And yet Nostradamus did better. Would you agree that his prophecies were of superhuman design? I suspect not. You'd find some reason to explain why they are too vague to count as prophecies, meanwhile ignoring how vague your own preferred group of prophecies are. Humans just simply could not have come up with the knowledge of the future that we find in the Bible. Nostradamus said, The young lion will overcome the older one on the field of combat in single battle. He will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Two wounds made one. Then he dies a cruel death. He wrote this in 1555. In 1559, King Henry II of France jousted with a younger nobleman. The young nobleman's lance splintered into two shards. One hit King Henry's eye, the other hit his temple. Henry survived an agonizing 10 days before he finally died. That's pretty damn accurate and specific, but I would be willing to bet that both of us would chalk this one up to coincidence, as Nostradamus wrote such a large volume of prophecies, some are bound to have some coincidental parallels to real events, much like how The Simpsons, a show that has been going for more than 30 years now, has often been shown to accurately have predicted the future. As you know, we've inherited quite a budget crunch from President Trump. How bad is it, Secretary Van Houten? We're broke. The country is broke. They don't really predict the future. They just have so much content that some of it is bound to match up at some point. But both Simpsons and Nostradamus predictions have something going for them that the Bible does not. They were actually verifiably written in advance of when the events that fulfilled them actually happened. The Bible doesn't even meet this lowest of bars with the New Testament. Number five. What we find is that the Bible, in a system that is easy to understand, answers the most profound questions that humans have. It really doesn't, though. Anytime I've asked questions about why God works the way he does, the best answers are always either deflection of some form or another, or an appeal to God's mysterious ways. Why does evil exist? Well, how could we know bad things are bad without God? 
very easily. That doesn't actually answer the question. Why does God do bad things? Well, he has a plan that we don't have access to that makes all these apparently bad things not bad. Mysterious ways. Any questions that the Bible actually does answer are done in the most simplistic way possible, an appeal to what amounts to magic. How did the universe start? God did it. How do stars form? God. Sure, it gets dressed up in a bunch of meaningless sophistry, but that's usually what it boils down to. Where did we come from? God made us. Why are we here? God wants us to be here. Where are we going? Wherever God tells us to go. What are we supposed to be doing while we are here? Carrying out God's perfect plan. Those are the answers to those questions that the Bible gives. They are not profound, they are simplistic and ultimately useless, and in the case of the origin of humanity, demonstrably wrong. Now, as much as I want to make jokes about him appealing to the answers to these questions being written at a grade school reading level in the Bible, in a way that on a 7th, 8th grade reading level that we can read and comprehend. This video is getting a bit lengthy, so I'm skipping to the next one. You know, number six, the personality of Jesus Christ. There is not another personality in all of human history that shines like the personality of Jesus Christ. What do you even mean by shines here? And really, no matter what you say, this point refutes itself. Jesus was supposed to be the human incarnation of God. Emphasis on human, not superhuman, human. So if Jesus has a superhuman personality, then he wasn't human. No matter where this goes, it doesn't end up helping your case. But even so, I doubt it's going to go anywhere definitive. Even Jesus' enemies have to admit he wasn't weak. He sometimes got angry, but he got angry about the right things. He exhibited love for those who society did not love. He corrected those who were in a position of authority that were abusing that authority. So never in the history of the world has a Mary Sue character ever been written, except for Jesus? Is that your argument? Because let me tell you, that type of character isn't called a Mary Sue because Jesus is the only one. And yet the whole time, Jesus never sinned, even when the worst injustices were perpetrated against him. Well, he chased people out of a temple at the end of a whip. If that's not a sinful behavior, then sin can't be a very good concept to use for measuring the morality of a behavior. The personality of Jesus Christ is simply a superhuman narrative that could not have been designed. It's actually a kind of narrative that amateur authors fall into all the time, making their characters too perfect and thereby rendering them unrelatable. So, if anything, it's an indication that the character of Jesus is poorly written. And then finally, the persistence of the Bible. You know, people have tried to eradicate the Bible. They have tried to get rid of the Bible. The Bible as we know it was decided upon by the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE. Christianity was made the official religion of the Roman Empire 12 years earlier in 313 CE. So the Bible as you understand it didn't even exist until after Christianity was well established as the official religion of the most powerful empire on earth at the time. Sure, some individual governments have tried to outlaw the Bible since then, but as those governments haven't been able to have a global impact on supply, it's really unsurprising that they failed to completely eradicate it. The rest of this part just goes into an argument from popularity. He brings up the fact that literally billions of Bibles exist today. Well, considering the fact that there are also literally billions of Christians alive today, and they're all supposed to have at least one copy of the Bible, I'd say that fact is a given. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Mario Mario, who says, Not sure why you use apologetics as if the ancient Hebrews believed the earth was billions of years old, and believed in a round earth, and didn't believe any of the biblical figures when all of that is wrong. The Hebrews did believe in a flat earth with a firmament, and they believed in the genealogy of all the religious figures, i.e. Adam and Eve, Moses, etc. This was seen as literally true. 
I don't think I've ever said that the ancient Hebrews were actually right about their cosmology. At most, I might have mentioned that the ancient Greeks figured out that the globe Earth around the same time as they were writing Genesis, so it really wouldn't have been special if they had figured it out as well. I do commonly mention that the ancient Hebrews likely did not intend a simplistic literal interpretation of the Genesis narratives, and that is true, and is made obvious by the fact that there are two conflicting narratives right beside each other in the final edit. They knew they conflicted and had contradictions predictions, but they weren't concerned about the stories being literally true. To the ancient rabbis, a text was considered dead when you could no longer find new meaning or interpretation in it. This does not mean that they did not think that the earth was flat with a solid firmament around it and had no idea what the age was. It just means that they would not have been dismayed to find out that it didn't literally match up with their creation accounts, as the literal story isn't what they considered most important about these accounts. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the leeches who suck the blood that is my channel. If you'd like to balance me with bile and phlegm, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time! Bloodletting, blood redding, bloodletting. I can't say bloodletting today.